Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Dan Scheiman, Bird Conservation Director for Audubon, Arkansas, State Office of the National Audubon Society. I've been birding for about 30 years, and I've been with Audubon, Arkansas for 15 years. And I'm really delighted today to share with you the intersection of two of my hobbies, birding and stamp collecting. And I was introduced to stamp collecting in day camp when I was around 11 or 12 years old, which is also around the same time that I became interested in birds. So it was no surprise, stamp collection quickly became my bird stamp collection. And just like there are so many species of birds on Earth, 10,000 species and counting, so many species of birds on Earth that it is impossible to see them all, there are also so many bird stamps that it's just impossible to collect them all. At last count, there were over 38,000 stamps depicting 4,200 bird species, including prehistoric and extinct birds. And the number of new issues just keeps growing every year, in part because birds are one of the most popular topicals to collect among philatelists, AKA stamp collectors. So with so many bird illustrations, <clears throat> I wondered what can we learn about ornithology through stamp collecting? What can we learn about ornithology through philately? And as it turns out, we can learn a lot. can learn about the origins of birds. The first feathered fossil found was Archaeopteryx, which proved the link between dinosaurs and birds. Now we know that birds are living dinosaurs, in fact. Archaeopteryx had a snout and teeth. It had other bony structures like a reptile, but it also had wings with feathers and feathers on the tail too. And those feathers are indistinguishable from modern birds. They share the asymmetry that all modern flying birds have in their feathers. So clearly Archaeopteryx was capable of gliding and weak flapping flight. And it also had perching toes like today's perching birds. Following Archaeopteryx, toothed seabirds with webbed feet thrived in the late Cretaceous. Tooth birds disappeared in the same cataclysm that exterminated the dinosaurs at the end of the Mesozoic, but among those survivors were the ancestors of today's toothless modern birds. Now birds occupy nearly every habitat on Earth, from hot, dry deserts to hot, humid rainforests, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, from remote oceanic islands where few other vertebrates colonize, to our own cities, gardens, and yards. Birds are everywhere. And the reason birds have been able to spread around the globe and occupy so many niches is because of their remarkable dispersal and migratory abilities. So some birds are short distance migrants, but they, they just move within a country or within a continent each year, like the greater striped swallow and the plum colored starling. Whereas other birds are long distance migrants, flying between continents or even across the globe in their annual journeys. And these journeys take them over vast stretches of inhospitable terrain, like open oceans, deserts, and mountains. Arctic terns are the masters of migration. The species sees two summers each year as they migrate along various routes from their northern breeding grounds down to the Antarctic coast for the summer and then back again about six months later. 
Recent studies have found that birds nesting in Iceland and Greenland make an average annual round trip length of about 44,000 miles. While birds nesting in the Netherlands migrate approximately 56,000 miles. And these are by far the longest migrations known in the animal kingdom. In order to adapt to so many different places on the planet, birds foraging habits vary among species. Some birds dive to catch their prey. Both the flying and flightless birds use their wings to literally fly underwater in pursuit of prey. How deep can these diving birds dive? Well, when scientists attached a small video camera to an imperial cormorant, the resulting footage showed the bird diving 150 feet to the sea floor to catch a fish, which was far deeper than they thought cormorants could dive. But emperor penguins, they dive deeper than any other bird. The deepest dive on record is an incredible 1,850 feet deep. Penguins have solid, dense bones to help them overcome buoyancy. Kingfishers plunge dive to catch their prey. From upwards of 30 feet above the water surface, the same height as an Olympic high dive platform, we'll hold a brief hover, select a fish to aim for, lock on target, and then plunge dive vertically, bill first into the water to seize their prey. Skimmers, on the other hand, just skim along the surface of the water to catch fish. Three skimmer species in the world are the only birds with a lower mandible that is longer than the upper mandible. That strange uneven bill of the skimmer has a purpose, of course. The bird flies low over the water with that long lower mandible plowing through the water. And it's really sensitive. As soon as it comes in contact with the fish, it snaps shut. Nectivory is the consumption of nectar, and nectivory has evolved independently in unrelated bird families around the world, especially the hummingbirds of the New World, North America, South America, the sugar birds of South Africa, and the sunbirds of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Even though these birds are not closely related to each other, they all have very similar adaptations to their bill, their tongue, and their digestive and excretory systems to deal with their shared diet that's high in sugar, high in water, low in protein. As their name suggests, bee eaters predominantly eat bees, wasps, and other flying insects, which they catch in midair by sallying out from an open perch. Small prey can be eaten on the wing, but bigger items are brought back to the perch. They're beaten on the branch until dead and then broken up. And insects that have poisonous stings, they're first smacked on the branch. And then while the bird closes its eyes, it rubs the insect to discharge the venom sac and the stinger so it can safely eat the insect. Amazing. Honey guides are named for the remarkable habit of just one of the species, the greater honey guide of guiding humans to bee colonies. And once the human opens the hive and takes the honey, the bird feeds on the remaining larvae and wax. Honey guides are among the few birds that regularly feed on beeswax. The greater honey guides have demonstrated the ability to understand the human call to accompany them to locate beehives. However, though, with the increasing urbanization, modernization in Africa, with more and more people buying honey and sugar from the stores, instead of foraging for wild honey, this guiding behavior is actually disappearing and may ultimately one day disappear altogether. And despite popular belief and the image depicted on the stamp and on the right, there's actually no evidence that honey guides guide honey badgers. <laughs> Although they will scavenge hives that are robbed by honey badgers and other animals. 
And egrets also use mammals to help them find food. Egrets forage in flocks in dry fields, usually in association with grazing animals, and they feed on the insects that are flushed from the grass by those animals. And at times, cattle egrets will even use tractors and lawnmowers for the same results. Oh, and then oxpeckers, they're cool too. Their name arises from their habit of perching on large mammals and eating the ticks, small insects, bot fly larvae, and other parasites off of those animals. They also eat the insects that are infesting wounds and they drink the blood of wounds as well. And actually blood may be the preferred food for oxpeckers. They've been observed opening up new wounds and enhancing existing wounds in order to drink the blood of their hosts. Oxpeckers also feed on earwax, dead skin, mucus, saliva, sweat, and tears. Yes, oxpeckers feed on blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, some host mammals are intolerant to the presence and will try to actively dislodge those oxpeckers, but uh, other species don't mind them and tolerate some tick removal on their face. However, what's, what's really interesting is that the, uh, the available evidence suggests that oxpeckers don't actually provide a tick reduction benefit for their hosts. And there may actually be costs to the host because of that habit of feeding on wounds. So the oxpeckers relationship with large mammals may actually be more parasitic than mutualistic, but in any case, it's definitely complicated. And alleged that Egyptian plovers pluck food scraps from the teeth of crocodiles, helping to clean the crocodile's teeth. But this actually has never been documented. It's just a myth. Egyptian plovers, however, do pluck insects, worms, and mollusks from the sand and gravel riverbanks that they live on along with those crocodiles. It just goes to show you that you can't believe everything you see on a stamp. Few birds use tools to get their food. And the best known avian tool user is the woodpecker finch from the Galapagos. When a bird finds prey in bark that it can't reach, it flies off to get a cactus spine or a stick and then uses it in multiple ways to get the insect out of hiding. And if its tool doesn't exactly fit the need, it will shape the tool to fit the need thus making these finches a tool maker as well as a tool user. The New Caledonian crow also uses sticks as tools to extract insects from bark. What they do is they prod and poke at the insect to piss it off and make it bite the tool in defense and then they yoink, take the insect out of the wood. They also will make different kinds of tools to serve different functions. Postage stamps also reveal aspects of the mating habits of birds. In monogamous species where males and females look alike and mate for life, such as in penguins and albatrosses, they use these synchronized ritualized movements to create the pair bond. During the non-breeding season, the pair will often spend months apart from each other. And when they reunite on the breeding grounds, they perform their ritualized courtship once again to reestablish their pair bond. But in most species, males look different from females and tend to be the sex that competes for mates and thus they're subject to sexual selection by the females. So males have evolved characteristics that signal their fitness, such as fancy plumages and striking displays. The resulting process of sexual selection leads to differences between the sexes in size and ornamentation, i.e. sexual dimorphism. The male's larger fancy feathers attract the female, but also may make him more vulnerable to predators or make it harder for him to find food. But if he can survive, and still look good doing it, then that is a reliable signal to the female that he is worthy, that 
He has the good genes she wants to pass on to her offspring. Birds of Paradise of New Guinea have some of the most elaborate plumages and courtship displays in the bird world. I love Birds of Paradise. Ornamentation on some of these species is so bizarre that when Western scientists first were describing these species based solely on specimens collected by natives and early explorers, they didn't even know how the heck these feathers function. So they guessed. Funny thing is, the resulting illustrations were wrong, but they persisted well into modern times until researchers finally put in the time, patience, and persistence to document the courtship rituals of these birds that live in remote and rugged rainforest terrain. The resulting truth is even stranger than fiction. And if you haven't seen a video of a superb bird paradise displaying, his transformation is a sight to see. Go on YouTube and look up the superb bird paradise. It's amazing. In some birds of paradise and many other species, males display in these courtship arenas called let. They're all gathered around a small area and the females come and gather around and assess their mating choices. The males compete intensely for dominance and that dominance determines who sires the most offspring. So for example, in black grouse, fewer than 10% of the males on the lek achieve 70 to 80% of all the matings. Dominance is a matter of age, experience and ability. And by mating with the dominant female, with the dominant male, females obtain for their offspring the genes responsible for that male's superior traits. Our birds construct and decorate an elaborate structure called a bower to show off their prowess to a female. Towers or walls of sticks are decorated with colored objects like fruit, snail shells, moss, leaves, flowers, and even man-made objects like coins, keys, jewelry, candy wrappers, ribbon, and glass. Different species have different preferences for colors and materials. And constructing and maintaining a bower takes considerable effort and experience. And males also have to protect their bowers from other thieving males who want to steal the display items and the material, the, the construction material. So the ability and the status of a male is directly reflected in the quality of his bower. And if the female likes what she sees, she'll mate with the male inside the bower, but then she'll leave to build a nest elsewhere while the male continues to display to attract another female. And once a pair has mated, then they have to go about the business of nest building. And the most common type of nest is a cup-shaped nest, usually placed in a brush or a tree, like those made by the painted bunting and the fairy bluebird. The materials used for most cup nests are thin twigs and grasses. Some birds, like hummingbirds and paradise flycatchers, line the outside of their nests with moss, lichen, and silk from the cocoons, from cocoons and from spider webs. So don't kill spiders because birds depend on spiders for nesting material. Some birds weave cup-shaped nests that are covered for extra protection, like in the black and red broadbill. Weaver birds weave elaborate hang nests. They actually use special knots to make the nest, and the types of knots used are species specific. And what's really cool is that the ability to weave a nest is genetically programmed in the male, but it does get better at it with time and experience. The nests of sociable weavers are the largest and most spectacular of all communal bird nests. They resemble these huge haystacks in a tree. 
and the pairs that occupy that structure share in the building of the common roof that can cover 100 or more separate nest chambers. Fiddler birds of Southeast Asia weave one of the most intricate of all nests. The edges of a large leaf or two smaller ones are sewn together to make a pouch and stuffed with nesting material. The stitching material may be plant fiber or silk from cocoons or spider's webs. And the bird will pierce a hole in the leaf margin with its beak and then draw the silk or the thread through the hole and then knot that fiber to prevent it from slipping back. And it does all of that without the use of hands. There's also a video of a tailor bird making its nest online, so look for that. In some species, they build their nests partly or entirely from mud. The barn swallow's nest is a cup of mud lined with dry grass and lined with feathers as well. The swallows build flask-shaped nests entirely from mud. And uh, like cliff swallows, many flamingos and albatrosses nest colonially, and they build these large bowl-shaped nests entirely from mud. But the world champion mud nest builder is the Rufus Hornero of South America. It constructs a veritable fortress using mud and grass which is often built atop a tree branch or a fence post, plain sight, no attempt to conceal it. The structure is roofed over <clears throat> and has a small side entrance, which leads in this roundabout way to the egg chamber. An average nest will weigh about nine pounds, <clears throat> and when hard baked by the sun, the nest provides a sort of protection enjoyed by cavity nesting birds. It's shaped like an oven used by local people for baking bread, hence the name Hornero, which is Spanish for baker. Some groups of birds, <coughs> like kingfishers, bee eaters, nest in burrows made of mud in sand riverbanks, or mud or sand riverbanks. Some seabirds, like puffins, excavate their own burrow in the ground, and burrowing owls generally use burrows made by mammals and then expand them. Although in Florida and Caribbean populations, the owls actually excavate their own nests. And these burrows provide <clears throat> excellent protection from predators. Just like tree cavities do too. Woodpeckers, of course, can excavate their own cavities from rotting wood or in large natural tree cavities. Parrots and toucans use natural tree cavities. And when a female hornbill selects her cavity, she'll go inside and then the male will bring lumps of moistened soil. Together, the two of them will plaster the entrance and lock the female inside. And there'll be just a little slit that the female can put her beak through. This way, the female and her young are protected from predators. And uh, even if a snake tries to get in the hole, she can fend it off with her bill. But of course, this makes the female and the young totally dependent upon the male for food, which he dutifully brings and passes on to the female through that slit, and then she passes it on to her chicks. And then once the young are ready to fledge, they break down the mud barrier and fly on out. The protected places to build the nest include mats of floating vegetation, like on a lake, like grebes build, nesting in a cave, like rock fowl and some swifts and some night jars do, or nesting on inaccessible sea cliffs, like many seabirds do. Now, most gulls nest on the ground, but the black legged kittiwake. That species is unique among gulls because it uses seaside ledges. And as a result, kittiwakes are different from other gulls. For example, the kittiwake's young are conspicuous, silvery white in color, whereas the other gull species, 
their young are cryptically colored to blend in with the sand that they are being, they're nesting on. And the Australasian mound builders or megapodes, they are unique among the birds because they don't even incubate the eggs with their body heat, like all of the birds do. They bury their eggs in these massive mounds of decaying vegetation. The male attends to that mound and adds or removes litter to regulate the internal temperature of the mound. The mound builder's bill is actually sensitive to temperature, so we can check on that. He wants to make sure that that internal temperature stays favorable for incubating the eggs. Some species <clears throat> use geothermal heat. Other species simply rely on the heat of the sun to warm the sand the eggs are buried in. And the male will tend the nest alone for 10 to 11 months out of the year. That long incubation period means that the chicks hatch fully developed with eyes open, full body coordination and strength, full wing feathers, and downy body feathers. When they dig their way out of the mound, they're able to run, catch their own prey, and in some species, they can even fly on the same day they hatch. They're actually not cared for by their parents at all once they hatch, and in fact, don't ever see their parents. The male walks away when the chicks are coming out. These chicks are known as super precocial. Now, most other precocial chicks still rely on their parents to find food and be protected from predators. When these precocial chicks hatch, they are well-developed little birds, usually covered in fuzzy down. They're capable of regulating their own body temperature. And in some species, the young leave the nest immediately and find their own food, whereas in others, they stay in the nest and the parents bring them food. And generally, the eggs of precocial species are relatively large, contain more yolk, and take longer to incubate than for altricial species. Altricial birds, when they hatch, they're naked, blind, and virtually immobile. They're completely dependent on their parents. Some species can leave the nest in a few days after hatching, but are still dependent on their parents for feeding and brooding, like in egrets and hawks. Others remain in the nest for long periods of time before fledging, like woodpeckers and all songbirds. But being in the nest certainly does not guarantee safety. Nesting birds and their babies really do face dangers, including predation and nest parasitism, like from cowbirds. Cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests and let the host bird raise their baby, often to the detriment of the host young. Giant cowbird, for example, specializes entirely on parasitizing oropendulas and caciques, which are members of the blackbird family found in the tropics. Birds face other threats too. Although the import of wild caught birds is banned in the US and Europe, millions of wild birds are still smuggled illegally and traded on the black market to meet the demand for the pet trade, for collectors, and even for bird fighting. Finches, weavers, parrots, and raptors are among the most heavily affected groups. Trapping has been identified as a contributing factor to the endangered status of one in 20 threatened species around the world. And some are even close to extinction as a result, especially a lot of parrot species. And that global bird trade is driven not only by the popularity of birds as pets, but also by poor regulation and enforcement, as well as poverty in many of the countries where these desirable species live. Habitat loss threatens birds worldwide, and uh, not just the obvious things like deforestation. Also, river systems are increasingly being altered by the constructions of dams to supply water and energy. 
dams flood the habitats upstream and deprive wetlands downstream of water, which affects these wetland dependent birds. Beach nesting species are sensitive to disturbance when people use the beach for recreation. Walking or worse, driving through nest colonies frightens the adults off the nest, leaving the eggs and chicks exposed to the elements and to predators. Off-road vehicles can even destroy nests and damage fragile beach habitat, like sand dunes that the birds need for protection. And commercial longline fishing is one of the main threats of albatrosses. Albatrosses and other seabirds are attracted to the bait set on these hooks. And when they dive down to get that bait, they themselves become trapped on the hooks and drown. An estimated 100,000 albatrosses per year are killed in this way. Pretty sad. Birds are even more sensitive to air pollution than we are because they have a higher breathing rate and they spend more time in the open air. Just like in humans, birds can suffer for, from respiratory illness, increased stress levels, poor immune systems, reduced re reproductive success, and even cancer caused by pollution. Water quality, water pollution, affects birds, pesticides from agriculture, heavy metals from industry, all these things that get into rivers and streams cause illness and death in birds. And of course, water pollution affects the fish and the other aquatic food these birds rely on. Trash from city streets gets washed into the creeks, eventually makes its way into the oceans where huge garbage patches are now accumulated. And floatable trash can be eaten by birds, causing death. 500,000 water birds are killed every year due to oil spills. Oil coats the feathers, robbing the feathers of their waterproofing and insulating ability. When the birds attempt to clean the oil off, they ingest the oil and become poisoned. Large oil spills also, of course, destroy critical habitat. According to the U.S. Department of, Department of Energy, 1.3 million gallons of petroleum are spilled into U.S. waters from vessels and pipelines in a typical year. And a major oil spill easily doubles that amount. The climate change is the number one threat to birds worldwide because it is global in scale. It has so many different consequences for different species. In the Arctic, the extent of sea ice that birds and other wildlife depend on is shrinking. <clears throat> in other places, the incidence of drought and wildfires are increasing. Bird ranges are changing in response to warming winters. And the timing of migration is changing too. Although not all species in a given ecosystem can adapt together, so there will be disruptions to the food webs that we know today. And sadly, for some birds, it is already too late. Stamps memorialize many extinct species. 161 species have gone extinct since the year 1500 species were lost in the last quarter of the 20th century, and three species have gone extinct since the year 2000. And although more than 80% of bird species live on continents, over 90% of extinctions have been on island. And often these extinctions are a result of the introduction of invasive alien species like cats, rats, and goats which either prey upon the native birds themselves or degrade the birds' habitat. Of course, continental bird species are far from immune from this. And there are species that are going extinct, even birds that originally had huge ranges like the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon used to be the most abundant bird on earth, and now it is gone. Fortunately, bird conservation efforts have grown over the last 100 plus years. 
2018 was the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is the most important legislation protecting North American birds. And many stamps promote the concept of conservation, like save mangrove forests, protect game birds, protect wetlands. Now, I'm not sure what these postage stamps really do for the cause of conservation, but it's nice to see them. Duck stamps, on the other hand, definitely contribute to bird conservation. And one of the easiest ways that you can support bird habitat conservation is by buying a federal duck stamp. Duck stamps, of course, are not postage stamps. They are conservation revenue stamps. 98% of the purchase price goes directly to acquiring and protecting wetland habitat for ducks and other birds. I buy both duck stamps and junior duck stamps every year. And 100% of the revenue of the sale of junior duck stamps goes to support environmental education activities for students. Duck stamps pay for habitat purchase and protection. Also important for birds is restoring degraded habitat through reforestation, like these two stamps are promoting. Also through the planting of native grasses to restore prairies and beaches. And even picking up litter, whether it's in a park or in your own neighborhood. That's something all of us can do to help birds. Natural tree cavities are fairly rare in the landscape these days because of our tendency to cut down standing trees as soon as they die. So the competition for cavities can be intense. And we can help those birds by supplementing natural cavities with nest boxes to give them more opportunities. And there's no doubt that the popularity of putting out nest boxes has really helped bluebird populations were bound in the last several decades. Now for albatrosses, they are having a harder time building their nests and having their nests stick together, those mud nests stick together. Rising sea levels and more and more torrential rainfall caused by climate change are really making it difficult for their mud nests to stay intact. So what conservationists are doing now is actually building artificial mud nests that are reinforced with concrete or coconut fibers. And tests of these, these nests are proving successful. Birds are using them and raising their chicks in them. We can also reduce the impact of global climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions through taking personal actions like mass transit and lobbying legislators and asking businesses to invest in the development of alternative energy sources. Audubon Arkansas right now is working on efforts to protect the economic viability of distributed solar in Arkansas. Ecotourism is another conservation measure. Ecotourism can be a win-win solution for the developing countries to meet both their conservation and economic needs. Globally, the most high biodiversity hotspots are also key regions for tourism development. People want to see large mammals on an African safari, and they want to see a diversity of colorful fish on a coral reef. So ecotourism provides an economic incentive for locals to protect these places because they can then make money off preserving their natural resources rather than extracting their natural resources. And research and monitoring are also critical components of conservation. So we know how bird populations are changing and whether our efforts are having an effect. Scientists monitor things like population size, nest success, diet, growth, development, and where the birds are going throughout the day, season, and year. What's really cool is that 
advances in si satellite telemetry means we can now track birds in real time throughout the entire year. Satellite tracking data gives us a detailed picture of bird migration routes, stopover sites, bottlenecks, and threats. For example, uh, satellite tracking has revealed that outside of the breeding season, gray-headed albatrosses travel right around the southern ocean. While at sea, these birds can travel 600 miles in a single day. And one gray-headed albatross was recorded as circumnavigating Antarctica in just 46 days. And this gives conservationists a better idea of how and where our fisheries may be impacting this and other albatross species. Stamps also commemorate the people who spent their careers studying birds. And no ornithologist is more depicted on stamps than John James Audubon himself. 1985 was the 200th anniversary of his birth. So in that year, countries around the world released Audubon stamps. Some featured the man himself in different stages of his life, but most feature his paintings. And I'm sure it helps that his paintings are in the public domain, so anyone is free to use those images. After Audubon, Charles Darwin is the next most illustrated scientist on bird stamps. He was an English naturalist best known for his contributions to the science of evolution. He established that all species have descended over time from common ancestors through the process of natural selection. Darwin made many of his observations that led to his theory, theory of evolution during a five-year voyage on the HMS Beagle. And that ship traveled around the world and made many stops. But the most famous is the one in the Galapagos Islands, where he observed the variation in the finches, the mockingbirds, and the tor tortoises among the islands. Some stamps were issued in 2009 to commemorate his 200th birthday. John Gould was a contemporary of Darwin. He was an English ornithologist and bird artist. He published and illustrated a number of monographs. And he is considered the father of bird study in Australia because he was the first to explore that continent's bird life and write a book about it. Gould studied some of the specimens that Darwin brought back. And it's Gould that recognized that the very different looking birds from the different islands of the Galapagos which Darwin thought belonged to different families, were all actually part of the same family, now nicknamed Darwin's finches. And Gould's work is referenced in Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. Alexander Wilson was a Scottish American ornithologist, naturalist, and illustrator. Like Audubon, Wilson traveled widely across North America, collecting birds, painting birds, and trying to sub secure subscriptions for his work, the nine-volume American Ornithology. He is now regarded as the greatest American ornithologist in the days before Audubon, and is called the father of American ornithology. Several bird species are named after him, including Wilson's storm petrel, Wilson's plover, and Wilson's warbler. And of course, they're illustrated with him on his stamps. Now, more contemporary bird conservationists are also memorialized on stamps. In the previous century, no one did more to promote an interest in living birds than Roger Tory Peterson. He was a keen birder and bird artist, and he is the inventor of the modern field guide. He developed the Peterson Identification System, which is renowned for the clarity of the illustrations and the delineation of relevant field marks. J.N. Ding Darling was a conservationist and cartoonist. He's the one who initiated the federal duck stamp program and designed the first duck stamp. 
illustrated here on his own stamp. President Franklin Roosevelt appointed him the head of the U.S. Biological Survey, which was the forerunner of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge in Florida is named for him. You probably have heard of Roger Tory Peterson and Ding Darling, but have you heard of William Phelps? He was a Venezuelan ornithologist. He and his wife published over 70 books on the birds of Venezuela, in which they described more than 200 new species. Together, they organized about 100 expeditions and collected over 1,000 species of birds. And their collection formed the basis of the Venezuelan Museum of Ornithology. And then Salim Ali was an Indian ornithologist referred to as the Birdman of India. He was among the first Indians to conduct systematic bird surveys across the country and wrote several books that popularized ornithology in India. Lastly, bird stamps reflect how intertwined birds are with our culture, our traditions, our holidays, and even our songs. For example, in the 12 days of Christmas, Five of the 12 gifts someone's true love gave to them were birds. 20 birds in total when you add them all up. That is a lot of birds to take care of. In this day and age, if you want to show someone you care, rather than send a bird, I suggest you send a bird stamp instead. Thank you. Now I will open the floor up to questions. Again, there's a chat box. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. All right, well, thank you everyone. I really appreciate your time and attention. I've got three more webinars that I scheduled for next week. So uh, those are posted on Audubon Arkansas's Facebook page. They're also, they will also be on our event page and email will go out to everybody. And uh, this week's webinars are all recorded and they are available on Audubon Arkansas's YouTube channel. And uh, so go check it out, learn more about birds, enjoy the birds, but do so safely. Bye everybody.